Hello, dear viewer, and welcome to another episode of the Catholic League Forum. We're going to keep our journey going through uh, Bill Donahue's new book, uh, The Truth About Clergy Sexual Abuse. And if you're enjoying our series, please remember to click the like button and subscribe. Uh, today we're going to talk about one of the more disappointing uh, portions of this, I think from a, a devout Catholic perspective, on the, the role that uh, some of the bishops, instead of really living up to their calling, uh, not all, but some seem to become enablers in the process. And, and Bill, in the book, you really tear into this. And I, I think uh, some of the terms uh, might not be as familiar for uh, the average person. So uh, maybe it might be helpful if you could uh, talk us through what you mean by in-group favoritism as being one of the, the causes. Right. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Now, we know that the, this problem, which, which occurred mostly from 1965 to 1985, uh, was the result of two parties. Number one, the enabling... Uh, bishop, and number two, the molesting priest. A lot of the attention has gone on the enabling bishop, not as much on the, on the molesting priest. Of course, there wouldn't have been enabling bishops had there not been a molesting priest in the first place. Now, what happened back in the 70s and 80s that, that allowed some bishops to be used like this? Uh, well, in-group favoritism is one. Now, I want to make something very clear to the, to the viewers here. I'm offering explanations here. I'm a sociologist. I am not giving them exculpation. I am not justifying. If when I give you an explanation of something, doesn't mean I'm justifying it. The first one is in-group favoritism. It is true across humankind, and it has been throughout history, that parents in particular, to start with them, will protect their youngsters. And by that I mean that if their child gets into trouble, maybe with the law, maybe there's a teenager, gets into a drunken fight by a 7-Eleven or something like that on a Friday night, the cops bring the kid home. What's the first instinct of the parents? They want to protect the kid. They don't want that to get out there. They don't want a public record of it. We understand that. What happens at NBC and CBS? What do they do? The exact same thing. Cops, lawyers, doctors. It's ubiquitous. This is human nature. I'm not using this as a justification. But I understand why a bishop, having been told that Father X... Uh, was is, is alleged to have abused someone, that he wants to kind of just corral him, find out if it's true, and if it is true, what can he do to rectify the condition? They don't want it out there in the media. They don't want to publicly embarrass the church. I think where they made a mistake is in not understanding that it, what we're talking about here in, in many of these cases was, were, was a crime. You can't treat a crime as just simply another offense. I understand the instinct. I also understand that as Catholics, we place a premium on forgiveness. So clearly the bishops felt, well, maybe we can help him out, so we're going to protect him. So in-group favoritism certainly played a role in why some bishops did not do what they really should have done. I think that's very interesting. Uh, another one that you cite is elitism. Uh, how did elitism factor into a bishop becoming an enabler? Some people in, in, in Catholic circles use the term clericalism. I don't, and that's for a reason which we're going to get to in other segments, because that, that term has been misused. By elitism, I mean somewhat similar to clericalism, but they use it to explain the molesting priest, which has nothing to do with it whatsoever. By elitism, I mean the sense of bishop knows best. All right, you've reported this, uh, Mrs. Jones, about Father X. Uh, thank you very much. We'll handle it from here. And then the bishop does nothing about it. Uh, that kind of elitism, that kind of arrogance, pomposity, uh, did drive a lot of the decisions. The bishops didn't do anything. They felt, well, I'm just, I am the bishop, I'm in charge, and I don't need to report to anyone. Uh, that created the problem. That's one of the reasons why they didn't do anything, because they felt like, well, I'll give it to the auxiliary bishop or somebody else, and they'll take care of it, and it'll go away. Uh, no, I think you have to understand that that kind of mentality is a problem, and it's a serious one. Absolutely. Uh, another one you point out is ineptitude. Uh, so you're saying that some of the bishops just weren't up to standard to well, stop it? I'm using the term ineptitude in a way to describe the refusal to recognize red flags. Mm. Look, it's not just the bishops here. I will indict, and I do in the book, lay Catholics as well as nuns and priests and others, household uh, uh, cleaners and whatnot. Other people knew that Father X had a problem. Right. What do they do about it? Nothing. There are all kinds of red flags. I know of a priest who was a molester. Okay, I knew him personally. He's now dead. And he had a pinball machine in his bedroom. Now, 
real men don't have pinball machines in the bedroom. They don't have little Donald Duck uh, dolls either. That's an example of somebody who has never grown. And so when you see red flags, if you hear what sounds like sexual sounds coming from uh, the priest's be uh, bedroom, and you don't report it, you don't say anything, uh, the ineptitude on the part of people, a lot of it's done driven by cowardice, but they should have figured it out. Mm, absolutely. Uh, another one you uh, point out, and I think this is very important for uh, people to keep in mind, is the failure to fo follow Vatican norms. You know, the, the Vatican norms on this subject go back to the Middle Ages. Canon law in the Middle Ages talked about condemning anybody who would put their hands on, on a youngster. So there's anybody who says, well, the, the, the Catholic Church didn't have any norms about it, doesn't know what they're talking about. There's been a lot of lies about that, too. Canon law was there. The problem is not canon law. The problem is the failure of many bishops and priests to follow it. So you can always make revisions and upgrades, but the problem essentially was not really there with the norms. It was the, the problem was the failure to follow them. Mm. And a uh, subject I know that is near and dear to your heart, uh, the therapist. As a social scientist, you obviously have read a lot on this subject. Uh, and you point to uh, therapists actually being a, a bigger part of the problem and not so much a, a help for this. Uh, could you explain that for us? The therapist, I'm talking about the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the guidance counselors and others. I'm not condemning all of them. I am simply saying this. People have to recognize the limits of their expertise. I'm a sociologist. We just don't understand everything when we talk about group behavior. We have to admit to that. The bishops listened to the therapists, particularly back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. That was the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, that we could fix everybody. Everybody can be rehabilitated. Well, in fact, they can't. There are incorrigible people, and they should have admitted that. But the attitude, uh, the arrogance on these therapists was, you give me Father X, I'll take care of him in six weeks, he'll be good to go, we'll go through all our training programs and the like. Uh, Quite frankly, they failed the Catholic Church. And what bothers me about the role of the therapist is that they're never mentioned, almost never mentioned. They'd rather put all of it on the bishop. Now, I blame the bishops for not being, for not scrutinizing and being more careful in listening to the advice of the therapist. But let's face it, the therapists were there, you know, with, with, their, with their doctorate degrees and the like and their therapy, and they're trying to tell the bishop, oh, we can take care of these people. There's nobody we can't fix. They bear a lot of the problem, but they got to cover up because the educators are right about it. They don't want to out their own people, and the media don't want to do it. I'll do it because they, their, their fingerprints are all over this problem, the role of therapists and the lousy advice that many of them gave back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when the problem was at its heyday. All right, Bill. Well, thank you very much for taking us through that, and thank you, dear viewer, for joining us today. If you enjoyed it, please make sure that you click the like button and subscribe. Thanks.